This is the lecture for module four, where we finish up William Connolly's book, Facing the Planetary, reading uh, chapters four, five, six, and the postlude. And I wanted to start things off by reading a paragraph from chapter four, uh, titled Distributed Agencies and Bumpy Temporalities, where Connolly writes, the planet itself consists of a series of interacting, partially self-organizing systems that often intersect. They may remain stable for a while and then go through rapid changes. So be wary of accounts in the human sciences on the right, center, or left that revolve around themes of sociocentrism. These might take the form of a social constructivism that focuses only on how different human cultures constitute nature, or a history driven by internal structural forces, or cultural progress of mastery over nature, or a history of capitalism driven by internal contradictory pressures, or a view that reduces agency to human linguistic processes alone and ignores variable degrees of non-human agency, or a providential image of nature in the last instance, or even a recent view that capitalism generates the Anthropocene, but climate and other non-human processes did not go through volatile changes on their own before that. Some advocates emphasize cultural diversity and make invaluable contributions to our, un to our understanding of regional and racial exploitations. But if they treat nature as a steady context or environment, or a set of indefinitely available resources, or composed of stable patterns with only gradual change, or a set of organic balances in itself, or a standing reserve, they misread key aspects of the Anthropocene and numerous critical moments in planetary history before it. In these chapters, Connolly uh, begins by inviting us to consider the import of the theory of plate tectonics for human political theory. What does it mean that the ground beneath our feet is not a stable background, but uh, a lively and uh, catastrophically unfolding process that it's not just human beings that have agency, rather there are, there are non-human planetary forces that express agency. And indeed, the human being, as we have conceived of it um, in the modern West, is in fact, um, when we examine it scientifically, right, composed of many levels of and layers of non-human agency. And if not for the agency of the bacteria in my gut to help me digest my food, the agency that I hope to perform and express in the political realm would, would be impossible. So human agency depends on non-human agency. And nature is not a sort of steady state background um, that we can presuppose as given and that will provide us with a solid foundation upon which to build our human societies as though that our human society would exist in some separate realm. Nature is no background to culture. Culture is ex itself an expression of nature, if we want to put it that way. Um, this is the way that a philosopher like Whitehead would try to overcome what he referred to as the bifurcation of nature. And Connolly will discuss Whitehead's so-called pan-experientialism, this view that experience goes all the way down. And for Whitehead, overcoming the bifurcation between nature and culture, or between inert mechanical objects and um, intentionally acting subjects, is, is to push experience all the way down, and, and perhaps all the way up uh, as well. And Connolly will make this dis distinction between micro-agencies or micro-experiences, micro-feelings, and macro 
agencies and feelings. So the question then becomes, yes, bacteria appear to be agential, they appear to be experiential, um, perhaps even corks and atoms are agents of some kind, actors. But what about galaxies? What about entire planets? What about stars? Are these also um, experiential? Connolly asked this question, and he ultimately won't go as far as Whitehead does. Connolly pulls up short and says, basically, maybe, maybe not. But he wants to point us in a, in a Jamesian sense to ask the question, uh, well, what difference would it make to our practice, to our everyday lives, if we were to, to adopt uh, a pan-experiential ontology? And I think when we do frame it that way, it's clear that, and Connolly himself will suggest as much, that this sort of uh, pan-experiential or pan-psychist uh, view of the universe allows us to feel more at home, allows us to feel more um, attached to this world. It makes us less susceptible to nihilism and resentment in the face of the human condition. Connolly is worried that our disappointment, and here our refers to the uh, formerly modern Western people who believed in the myth of progress, who believed that science and technology would gradually lead to increased freedom and rationality. Because this whole project has failed, utterly failed, there's a great deal of disappointment, and it's disappointment that goes to the very roots of our sense of human identity. And without an alternative image of the human, an alternative myth of the human, the form, the human project, we risk becoming resentful of, of our condition and we risk um, becoming nihilistic. And, you know, this is urgent for, for Connolly, that even people on, on the left who believe in climate change and who believe that capitalism is, uh, is, is economically unjust in the way that it, it distributes resources and that some social uh, intervention, some political intervention is necessary, fail to act, right? Because of passive nihilism, as we discussed last time. So we don't have to be aggressive nihilists to, to risk, uh, to be part of the problem, right? To, to risk allowing this catastrophe to continue to unfold and worsen. We can just be passive nihilists who uh, find the situation so dire that it's not worth acting. So how do we infuse right hope and joy and um, creativity into our, our political activities? That's, that's the question that Connolly is focusing on and, and really trying to emphasize for us. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, he's drawing on Whitehead who, who locates uh, differential degrees of feeling and internality and experience in, in non-human and even, even non-living processes. Um, Whitehead is, is then compared by Connolly to other thinkers like uh, the anthropologist Eduardo Vivieros de Castro who articulated this notion of multinaturalism as a rejoinder to the modern liberal ideal of multiculturalism. So rather than there being um, multiple cultures sort of uh, floating above one underlying unified nature, which is the standard modern view, right? Um, that we can, we can all sort of dress up and pretend to play our, our cultural games and uh, perform our rituals and so on. But at the end of the day, we all accept and acknowledge that uh, science and technology are objective and science accesses the truth about nature that underlies 
all the many cultures and that technology will ultimately allow us to to control that nature and thus um, you know culture becomes a uh, a sort of decoration on top of what is what is ultimately a um, a natural system. What Viveros de Castro suggests is that really the nature of reality is is such that there are multiple natures, uh, and that science itself is also multiple. There are as many. Uh, natures as there are sciences, right? Because each paradigm articulates its own domain of relevance, has its own um, crucial experiments that inframe a certain set of um, actors and, and causes, and within that frame is able to uh, provide knowledge and make predictions about how certain isolated systems of entities will behave. But the universe as such cannot be um, so easily unified into one system called nature, just as the many sciences cannot be so easily unified into a single system, right? Even in the science namely physics, that's supposed to be the hardest, the most uh, mathematically robust and systematic. We have two theories, relativity and quantum theory, that describe the very large and the very small, and that don't, in fact, connect in any widely accepted way. Um, two totally isolated theories. So if we can't even get these two parts of physics to cohere into a single view of what nature is. What makes us think we could get all the other special sciences to cohere in a unified, systematic uh, picture of what nature is? So the idea of nature as multiple, the idea of a pluriverse, um, is related also to what we could call um, an ontology of perspective. And someone like Nietzsche would be an example of an ontology of perspective, or Leibniz, certainly Whitehead, um, and Viveros de Castro in his anthropological work discusses um, how many indigenous populations have a view of the cosmos wherein um, all cosmic constituents are at least virtual people, uh, whether they're living or non-living. Right? A mountain is a virtual person in the sense that it could become a person at certain moments, if certain human communities decide to interact with it in a certain way, or if it decides to interact with human communities in a certain way. Um, trees can be persons. Mountains can be persons. Rivers, lakes can be persons. And this more primal indigenous way of relating to the natural world is something we'll explore later when we read the introduction to a book by another anthropologist, uh, Eduardo Cohn, who in his book, uh, How Forests Think, will discuss how a um, Amazonian tribe, a tribal people is able to, a colonized, um, tribal people is able to continue to relate to the, the jungle surrounding them in a, an animate as an animate presence as a as a community of animate beings living and non so we'll, we'll return to this idea um, later of multinaturalism Latour's work is also deeply influenced by this approach as well um, Connolly will return to this Kantian problematic that we've been um, discussing throughout this semester, beginning in, in Module 1, where we saw the Jamesian empirical, radically empirical alternative to Kantian transcendentalism and the idealism that followed in its wake. And Connolly is pointing out that so many modern political theories have assumed this basically Kantian transcendental perspective that um, our 
our knowledge, our scientific knowledge of a deterministic nature is secured by a this, this idea of a noumenal self uh, that's removed from the physical world that is free. And there's a sort of uh, what Connolly refers to as a command model of morality that, that follows from this, a morality of duty that follows from this notion of the human self that, that is separate from the human body, but, but somehow mysteriously connected to it through the will and through sensation and through desire and, and representation and the whole cognitive machinery of the human understanding. And this noumenal self has a duty. I mean, it's, duty is, is God-given and it must, in, a, in, in, in this way, struggle in a puritanical fashion to overcome its animal-like uh, tendencies. And, you know, of course, Connolly is, like Whitehead, recognizing um, the need for an alternative to this Kantian transcendental approach. And I've called this a descendental approach to philosophy, building on Whitehead and, and Schelling, who is often characterized as an idealist who followed in the wake of Kant, but also articulated a uh, really deep philosophy of nature that challenges many of the Kantian and, and idealist assumptions. Schelling saw mind as, an, as emergent from nature, as a, an intensification of, uh, of a power or a potency present already in, in, in the earliest phases of nature's evolution. So, like Whitehead, Connolly wants to um, seek out and identify subterranean dimensions of human experience, right? So this is a descendental approach to philosophy where we go down into the cave again and don't just ascend and remain in, in the clear light of day. It's not that we want to just invert Plato and um, not seek out the light. I think the idea of a, a descendental philosophy and an inversion of, of Plato's myth of the cave is really calling us to, to recognize the need to go up and down um, and to be able to play with the difference between light and dark. And to recognize that even when we are up above and taking in the bright light of the sun, seeing things in themselves, we're still seeing images. And so if this is a descendental philosophy, it's also an aesthetic philosophy, a, a theory of reality that, that roots aesthetics all the way down in, in, in the, to the very groundless ground of, of, of reality as it erupts into being. And so unlike Plato, who would contrast the image to its model the, as a copy, a mere copy of its model, um, thinkers like Whitehead and, and Connolly and drawing upon them is asking us to, to dwell with to dwell on the image, um, to think, engage in what Connolly refers to as uh, slow thinking, um, because he thinks it's in this slow thinking that we generate new thinking in response to new events, rather than just sort of shutting down as a result of the trauma. Um, if we dwell on the images, they deepen, they morph, and something more profound is uncovered. And there's no escape from these images. We shouldn't expect to arrive at the idea that underlies the image, at the eternal form underlying the, the changing, shifting, temporal image. It's always more images, but images exist at various depths, right? And there are some images that are more important, more beautiful, than other images. So this, again, isn't a form of relativism. 
So Connolly will talk in, in the final, the postlude, about theory being not just about escaping the cave to see things clearly, right? It requires a to and fro movement back and forth from above to below. So Connolly writes that complex processing of micro modes of feeling, thinking, perception, desire, and judgment are in play well before they reach consciousness for further work. Such an account seeks to illuminate various aspects of non-human nature through the exploration of affinities with subterranean features of human life. So by engaging in various uh, experiments, whether through art or technology, psychedelics, meditation, by experimenting in these ways on our own consciousness, we can discover these micro modes of feeling and perception and we can shake them loose and allow them to reorganize such that we not only become capable of new thoughts, but of new behaviors, new desires. Um, because the problems that we are faced with are, are deeply rooted habits, right? They're not just um, systems and institutions out there that we can rail against. They are inside of us. They're Neoliberalism is insidious in the sense that it infects our very emotions, our very desires, and shapes our sense of, of who we are and what the good life is. So if we want to shake free of those chains, we need to be able to delve into these subterranean dimensions below the level of our conscious, rational ego and transform uh, our being there and then see what erupts into consciousness after that in chapter 5 Connolly talks about this notion of the swarm he makes an analogy between beehives and the way that uh, when the hive when, when the, the bees need to find a new hive they'll send out scouts to various in various directions who will then return and using pheromones and dancing they will try to communicate to the hive that, that their location is the best and describe its, its characteristics. And eventually through um, a sort of more or less democratic process, a, a collective decision is made to, to choose one of the hives as described by a scout. And the group of bees goes off and swarms in that, in that direction to make a new home. And Connolly draws on this analogy with beehives because of the way that it, it gives us a model of decision-making, of a decision-making assemblage that doesn't have a central coordinator. So Connolly's committed to democracy, he's committed to pluralism, and decision-making is difficult in that context, but we have models. There are other species that are able to pull this off. And so Connolly is hopeful that we human beings uh, can also mimic the bees in finding ways to um, align and assemble across our, our various diversities, across our differences, uh, in order to enact general strikes, right, that shut down the um, machinery of the system such that we then, as workers, as immigrants, as um, marginalized populations, that we then have leverage to force the state apparatus and to force the corporate world to, to alter their behavior. Um, because unless we are able to find a sort of pluralist assemblage like this, if, if, if we continue to allow neoliberalism to separate and isolate us into various interest groups, various, uh, various fixed identities, then we will continue to remain powerless. So, right, so much of Connolly's project is an attempt to find a way to motivate us across differences, to cooperate on behalf of um, the struggles of, of various types of people to, to exist on the planet Earth in a just society and a flourishing ecosystem.